Okay. So I'm very happy today to be um, introducing Shreya Vartan uh, as uh, this week's QFI speaker. So Shreya got her Bachelor of Science from Harvard in 2017. And right now she's a PhD student at MIT studying under Professor Hong Lu, where she's been working on work uh, on quantum chaos, hydrodyna hydrodynamics, and ADS-CFT. So please help me in welcoming either by unmuting yourselves or by uh, clapping virtually, Ms. Shreya Varden. Great. Um, thanks a lot for the uh, introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a process called void formation and operator growth and some of its consequences. Uh, and this is based on some work with my advisor, Hong Liu. Uh, and today I'm mostly going to be talking about this first paper from last December. Uh, and towards the end, I'll touch on some aspects of um, the second paper and some work in progress. Um, so uh, before I start talking about this process in operator growth, I want to talk a little bit about the motivation for studying these questions. Uh, which came from some existing results about entanglement growth in many body systems um, and some puzzles um, which, uh, um, uh, which we wanted to try to understand. Um, so broadly, the question that we're interested in is about the dynamics of many body systems. Um, and in general, we all know from our experiences in various fields of physics that such systems are very difficult to describe because there are a large number of degrees of freedom and they're all strongly dependent on each other. But uh, we also know that in equilibrium, the, dis uh, the description of these systems can often become simple because we can end up with a small number of emergent quantities such as temperature or pressure or entropy with which we can characterize the system. Um, but out of equilibrium, as the system evolves in time, again, there are in principle an infinite number of parameters to keep track of. Um, and in quantum mechanics, we might, um, it's, it's very difficult to keep track of detailed information about the state. But in recent years, uh, entanglement growth has emerged as a useful probe of the dynamics of quantum many body systems. So the entanglement entropies provide a simple set of quantities which can give us some uh, broad information about what is happening in the system. So some natural questions to ask are whether there are some universal features of entanglement growth which are common among all interacting many body systems or at least among a large class of them. Um, and then another natural question is whether there are differences in entanglement growth between integrable and chaotic systems. So these questions have been explored in a lot of previous work. Uh, but let me first just introduce the setup that we should have in mind. So uh, imagine that we have some spin chain system in one plus one dimensions. And suppose that the initial state has a small amount of entanglement between different regions. So in particular, we can imagine that it's just a product state between all the different sites. And then if we consider any region A in the system, then the initial state is a product state between A and its complement A bar. Okay. But under time evolution, we expect that the interactions between different parts of the system should generate entanglement. And this can be measured by the growth of quantities such as the von Neumann entropy or the Rennie entropies. And again, these are quantities which have become very familiar in recent literature, but let me remind you quickly what they are. So, if you take the density matrix um, on the full system and then take the partial trace over the region A bar to get the reduced density matrix for the region A, then the von Neumann entropy and the higher entropies are defined in this way by taking traces of this reduced density matrix. Um, and for most of this talk, I'll be talking about the n equals 2 case of this quantity, uh, so the second Rennie entropy. But towards the end, I'll comment on generalizations to higher any entropies, okay? So we expect that interactions should generate entanglement. And indeed, from previous calculations in a variety of systems, it was found that if we take the region A to be a single interval, then this, these entanglement entropies do increase and they increase in a very simple way. So first, the entanglement growth is linear in time, and then it saturates to some constant value. Um, and the time scale on which it saturates scales as roughly the length of the system. Okay. Um, and so this is when we take it to be a single interval. And um, this, um, uh, sim uh, this linear growth and saturation can be reproduced by a very simple picture um, called a quasi particle picture. So um, what we should have in mind here is that there's some initial uh, disturbance in the system, which produces local EPR pairs between adjacent sites. Uh, 
And then we can imagine that the two particles in each pair propagate away from each other at some constant velocity. So then if we keep track of the locations of all the different uh, particles in each pair as a function of time, then we can calculate the entanglement entropy of various regions. And so in particular, when we take the region to be an interval, we can see in a very simple way that you should see first a linear growth and then saturation. Um, so this picture is able to reproduce the linear growth, but it only really makes physical sense for integrable systems because in chaotic systems, we don't really expect that they should have a simple uh, description in terms of quasi-particles which don't interact with each other, okay? Um, and indeed, we find that this picture doesn't really work if we consider two or more intervals in chaotic systems. Um, so uh, let me show you a particular example where we take two intervals which are of the same length L, and they're separated by an interval of length R, which is greater than L. Then in this case, in the quasi-particle picture, if we again keep track of where all the different particles are going, we see that first the entanglement increases linearly, and then it reaches a constant value for some time, but then it shows a non-monotonic behavior where it decreases again and then increases back to the saturation value. Okay. Um, and in a chaotic, uh, and so this kind of uh, non-monotonic behavior is seen in some integrable systems. Um, but in chaotic systems, so in particular, this result is for a holographic CFT, but more generally in chaotic systems, we expect that you shouldn't see this kind of decrease at intermediate times, and the entanglement entropy just increases linearly and then saturates, okay? So, um, so these results were obtained in different systems through uh, some sophisticated technical calculations, but there wasn't really a general understanding of what the physical picture is that explains all of this. So in particular, what explains the universality for a single interval and these differences for multiple intervals, okay? Um, so this was what we wanted to answer. Um, and now let me briefly describe um, what approach we took uh, and how in this process we used some properties of operator group. Um, so are there any questions at this point about the results that I summarized so far? Okay. Um, great, so, um, uh, so we wanted to find a unified picture that explains these results for entanglement growth. Uh, and our approach was to take the density matrix of the initial state and then decompose it in terms of a convenient basis of operators. And then we used some simple features of the Heisenberg evolution of these basis operators in order to calculate the evolution of entanglement of the state, okay? Um, and in doing so, we used two key universal features of operator growth in a many-body system. So one feature is something which has been studied a lot in the recent literature, which is that the support of the operator grows as a function of time. Uh, and the second property we used was something that we introduced in our paper, um, which is something called void formation. So in the next couple of slides, let me uh, remind you what operator growth is and um, introduce void formation. So may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, you know, your initial density matrix is for a product state, right? That's right, yeah. We'll consider an initial product state. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk in more detail about exactly what I meant by decomposing it, etc. Um, yeah, but uh, so let me remind you about operator growth. So uh, again, the setup that we should have in mind is that we have a spin chain in one plus one dimensions. And then we can consider an initial operator which is localized at a single site in the spin chain. Um, then from some, uh, a lot of recent work by these authors as well as others, it's been found that the support of this operator should increase with time in a chaotic many body system. Um, and in particular, this has been seen to lead to decay of out of time ordered correlators. Um, and in particular in many systems, in fact, in both integrable and chaotic systems, we find that the operator endpoints just move outwards ballistically. So it can be an exact statement to say that the operator endpoints are just moving outwards with a constant velocity. Okay, uh, so this was a property of the endpoints of the operators. And uh, in our paper, we asked a question about the internal structure of the operator between the endpoints. Um, so in particular, we asked if we consider some region A between the endpoints of the time evolved operator, then is there some probability that the time-evolved operator is equal to the identity in that region, okay? 
Um, so if it is, if there is some probability of this happening, then we say that there is a non-zero probability of void formation. So let me define this more precisely. Um, at any time t, with respect to any region A, we can write the time evolved operator, or t, as a sum of two parts. Um, so we can write this part, O1 of t, which is equal to the identity in A, and it can be something non-trivial in A bar. Um, and we have some O2 of t, which is orthogonal to the identity in the region A. And then we say that um, if uh, we can always do this decomposition, and if we find some uh, non-zero O1 part on doing that, then we say that um, um, we refer to this as void formation in the region A. Uh, and then we can associate a probability to this process by defining an inner product in operator space, uh, which is analogous to the usual inner product uh, in state space. So we define this for two operators OA and OB by finding the trace of OB dagger times OA. And then with this inner product, we can define the probability of void formation of the operator O in the region A, just the norm of this O1 part, which has the void, divided by the norm of the full operator. Okay. Um, so because we had this picture that uh, in chaotic systems, the support of operators tends to grow, we should expect this probability to be small at late times. Uh, but we find that in any many body system, even if the void formation probability from individual operators is small, um, such processes have some important consequences. So one important consequence is that it ensures the unitarity of entanglement growth. And I'll explain in a lot of detail what this means. Um, and such processes are also, use, uh, are also the mechanism by which multipartite entanglement is generated between disjoint regions. Um, and um, understanding the void formation probabilities in different kinds of systems will help explain differences in entanglement growth between integral and chaotic systems that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this was a brief introduction to the different properties of operator growth. Are there any questions at this point? Okay. Um, okay, so um, now let me, uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll essentially be building the tools with which we'll see um, all of the results in the rest of the talk. So uh, we're gonna understand how to relate operator growth and entanglement growth so that we can see why um, void formation leads to certain properties of entanglement growth. Um, so uh, we can define a probability of transition from any initial operator to any final operator at time t by using the same inner product that I mentioned before. Um, and this is defined very analogously to transition probability between states. So uh, we evolve the OI uh, up to time t and then take its inner product with the operator OF um, and take the absolute value squared and divide by the norm. And uh, the second Renyi entropy can be related to these operator growth probabilities for a certain set of initial and final operators. Um, so uh, let me show you how this is done. So for concreteness, consider that we have an initial pure product state in the system and say that it's a product of the same state psi between all the different sites, okay? So then uh, for such a state, we can always write the density matrix as some normalization factor of one over Q to the L times a sum of um, Q to the L basis operators, which can be extended in the full system. So where Q is the dimension of the Hilbert space at each site. So since the dimension of the full Hilbert space of the system is Q to the L, there's a total number Q to the 2L of basis operators. And this initial state just happens to be written as a sum of Q to the L out of them, okay? Um, and uh, the picture that you should have in mind for this is um, that it can be decomposed as a sum of this type where Whenever I have an unshaded site, uh, this means that there is an identity operator. And if I have a shaded site, that means that there is a non-trivial operator. So this basis is a tensor product between all the different sites. Okay. So then um, for the trace of row zero to be equal to one, uh, we always need to have the identity and all as one of the terms in the sum. And then uh, we can have all possible uh, non-trivial operators um, on any combination of sites in the system. So you can have non-trivial operators at any single site anywhere in the system or at any two sites anywhere in the system. 
um, and so on. You can also have something which is non-trivial on all sides. Um, and then we can find the time evolution of the state just by finding the Heisenberg evolution of each of these operators in this sum. Okay, so of course the identity operator under any unitary evolution will always evolve to the identity. But then we can consider this first non-trivial operator here, which at any later time can be expanded as a, a sum in the full basis with some coefficients. Um, and these coefficients will uh, evolve as a function of time. Okay. So then if we find this kind of time evolution for each of the operators in the sum, we find the time evolution of the whole state. Um, but now when we take the trace over the region A bar to find the reduced density matrix for A, um, then, um, so suppose the region A is everything to the left of this black line. And uh, when we take the partial trace, we only keep terms like these uh, circle terms here, which are trivial in the region A bar. And if we have any non-trivial operator in the region A bar, then such terms will just contribute zero when we take uh, the trace to find the reduced density matrix. Okay, so as a result of this, we can see that if we um, plug this into the expression for the second Rennie entropy of A, which is just um, the trace of rho A squared, um, then we find that this can just be written as a sum of the probabilities that initial operators in the initial state are trivial outside A at time T or contained entirely within the region A at time T like these circle operators, okay? Um, and due to operator growth, we expect that many operators which are initially contained within A will acquire wow. support outside of A. So we expect that the sum should decrease. Sorry? So we expect that the sum should decrease with time. And, um, and the decay of the sum corresponds to the growth of the secondary entropy, okay? Um, so this uh, formula um, for the secondary entropy is something that we'll be using uh, extensively throughout the rest of the talk. Uh, so please let me know if you have any questions about this. So how can we be sure about the completeness of this basis of all operators? So you are expanding the density matrix in terms of these operators, right? Yeah, so I expanded the initial density matrix in terms of Q to the L out of the Q to the 2L operators. But then when I finally expand the time involved operator, I can have all possible operators in the basis. So even though I show all non-trivial operators with um, like a blue shaded side, there are many different possibilities for what the non-trivial operator can be. Does that make sense? So, so I, I'm not sure about the completeness of, of, of this basis, so. Oh, okay. you can always choose a complete base Q to the two L operators if the dimension of your Hilbert space is Q to the L. So I haven't told you explicitly what the basis is, um, but I am working with some complete basis, which is a tensor product between all the different sites. Yeah. Okay, um, okay. great. Uh, all right, so, so this is the expression that we'll be using. We'll always be counting the total probability that operators from the initial state end up in the region A. So now let's uh, try to use this relation between operator growth and entanglement growth uh, and see the interplay between them and between unitarity, which leads to some interesting results. Um, so because we're interested in questions about the internal structure of the operator between its endpoints, um, uh, we'll make the simplest possible assumption that we can about how the endpoints themselves evolve. So we'll just assume that they show sharp light cone growth, which means that um, if I take some initial operator which has its left endpoint at XL and its right endpoint at XR, uh, then uh, at least it can evolve to a superposition of many operators. But for each of these operators, their left endpoint is at XL T and their right endpoint is at XR plus T. So we're assuming that with probability one, the endpoints move outwards with velocity one, okay? And if we assume this, um, then it's convenient to define uh, some regions in space, uh, which uh, I'll be making use of a lot. So if I have some interval A at time T, then I can define its past domain of dependence or D of A as this region, which lies between the ingoing past light cones of A.
Okay. Uh, and in particular, notice that for times greater than the length of A divided by two, this region just becomes empty. Um, and then similarly, if I have um, some semi-infinite region, then I can again, I only have to consider one light cone and I end up with a semi-infinite region, which is its domain of dependence. Uh, and of course, this never becomes empty because the region is infinite, okay? Uh, and then in some cases, it will also be useful to use this region J of A, which is the region between the outgoing parts of A. So this is the full past region, which is in causal contact with A, okay? Um, so try to use this to find for a single interval A. Okay, so if we want to find um, this quantity at time t, then um, we can just write this as uh, the sum of probabilities that initial operators end up in A. Um, and so if we consider this region D of A, then um, if we have any initial operator whose endpoints are outside D of A at uh, the initial time, then of this sharp light cone growth that I mentioned, um, these endpoints will travel outside of A at time t, okay? So such operators will all contribute zero to this sum. Um, but if I consider any operator which is inside this region D of A, uh, which is cont entirely contained inside this region D of A at the initial time, then it will always propagate to something um, contained entirely within A at time t, okay? So all such initial operators will contribute one to this sum. So then I find that uh, this uh, e to the minus s given by one over q to the a times the number of initial operators in the region d of a. Uh, and this number of initial operators was just q to this 2t because that size of this region is always a minus 2t. So this tells us that e to the minus s decays exponentially as q to the minus, okay? And of course, uh, this only works for times less than a over two for which this domain of dependence region is not trivial. Um, but for times Can greater than questions? a over two, yes? On the last slide, um, so are you just um, excluding any possibility of there being a void just on the light cone itself of these larger operators? Yes, we, we are, yeah. So that's an assumption that we need endpoints that you don't have, you can only have a void between the endpoints. But uh, the endpoints themselves always travel with uh, uh, probability one with velocity one. And then this is assumption is just because you see this kind of thing in most models you study? Yes, or? exactly. Yeah. Uh, so in, we considered three different models, um, two of which were integrable and one of which was chaotic. And in all of these we see Thanks. Yeah. Uh, did anyone that have any other question? question here? Yes. Uh, so you're assuming locality of the interaction of the Hamiltonian in the whole discussion until now, right? Uh, yes, definitely, because uh, otherwise there would be no reason why the operators would only propagate uh, with some velocity uh, and not just really non-local. So yes, this is all for a system with local interactions. And in fact, we're assuming that uh, the interactions are very strictly local. So we can imagine that we have something like a circuit so that uh, for example, this region doesn't affect anything outside of its light cone. Um, so that's a sort of simplifying we make everywhere. Mm -hmm, Wait, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, so for times greater than A over two, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this domain of dependence region just becomes empty. Um, and then, uh, so this is telling us that if we have any non-trivial initial operator, it will necessarily become non-trivial outside A. Uh, so even if I have a single operator, which is a point uh, at the center of A, then this will propagate to something which doesn't remain contained in A at time t. Um, and, uh, but of course, the identity operator always evolves to the identity, and that can be seen as being within any region. And so, that will always uh, contribute one to that sum here, right? So um, this tells us that for times greater than A over two, uh, the entanglement entropy is just always equal to one over Q to the A, okay? Um, and of course, this was exactly the behavior that I showed you before, uh, was seen in many integral and chaotic systems. Um, and in a number of systems that we studied, we verified 
that this um, sharp light cone growth of operators is the reason why the entanglement grows linearly. So unlike the quasi-particle picture, um, this is an explanation for linear growth which works for both integral and chaotic system. Um, and, okay, so now suppose we wanted to apply the same reasoning to find uh, the entanglement growth for the complement of a finite interval in the system. So if we wanted to find the entanglement in A bar, which is the union at the semi-infinite region B1 and the semi-infinite region B2. Um, so here we again want to use the same formula. And uh, if we apply seasoning to before, then we might argue that um, again, initial operators from the region D of B1, union D of B2 should contribute because we can see that they end up inside B with probability one. Um, so then from this reasoning, we would again with Q to the minus 2T. Um, but now as B1 and B2 are infinite, these D of B1 and D of B2 regions never become empty. So it seems that the entanglement entropy of A bar just continues to increase like 2T log Q for all times, okay? So what we seem to have found is that the entanglement entropy for A increases and then saturates for times greater than A over two, but the entanglement entropy for A bar just continues linearly for all times. But this is a problem because um, our initial was a pure state on the full system. And let me remind you of two facts. So under unitary evolution, states should evolve to pure states. And for any pure state, the entanglement entropy of A should be equal to that of A bar, okay? Um, but from the above result, that the entanglement entropy of A is very different from that of A bar for times greater than A over two. So this is a contradiction. Um, and this means that we should examine our derivation of the entanglement entropy of A bar a little more closely. Um, Okay, so in what we did, we implicitly assumed that um, any initial operator which is not contained with the, within these domains of dependence will necessarily become non-trivial in A at time t. Uh, so we were always assuming processes like these have to take place with probability one. Um, but in fact, such operators can become equal to, uh, uh, can become trivial in A if they fall in between their endpoints. Okay, so if a process like this occurs, so we take into account the non-zero probability of such processes. Um, and in order to do so, it's useful to define a function G of A C T, which is the sum of probabilities that initial operators in the initial state, which are contained within a particular region C, become trivial in A at time T. Okay. So then function, if we do the counting more carefully, we find that the uh, e to the minus S for A bar is equal to this factor of q to the minus 2t, which we got from the domains of dependence, uh, times this factor g of a, j a t. Uh, so j of a region, let me remind you, is just the region in causal contact with a in the past. And uh, by uh, including the, we take account all processes of void formation from operators in j of a. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this? Okay. So now when we include this factor, um, then we find that from unity, um, we require that e to the minus s for a should be equal to that of a bar. Uh, and that gives us this constraint on uh, one, sorry. Um, that it has to be one for times less than a over two. Um, and it has to be greater than one and more precisely equal to q to the two t minus a for times greater than a over two. And uh, I mentioned that there are both integrable and chaotic systems with the property of sharp light cone growth. And this has to be a universal constraint for both of them. Um, and uh, so when this quantity is just equal to one, this constraint comes from the identity operator. Okay, so in this situation, there are no operators in the region J of A which are forming voids. Um, but for, uh, for times greater than a over two and greater than than one, we know that there are some non-trivial operators which have to form a void in the region A, okay? Um, and in particular, they have to satisfy this constraint. Um, so, so let me just remind you that even though we expected that the problem was small, um, if we ignored it completely, then um, uh, we find these very large violations of unitarity important to take into account. Okay, as far as what we did so far, uh, our only input is that 
top light cone group of the points of the operators. And from this, uh, we obtained the entanglement for a single interval. And then we used the fact that we want our time to be unitary, which puts a constraint on entanglement. That derive a universal constraint on a different property of operator group, which is the probability of void formation in the region in some interval. Okay, and now we can extend this reasoning to more intervals. So uh, one thing that we can do is we can use again the relation between operator growth and entanglement growth to see that because of this universal constraint on void formation, the results for entanglement growth for two finite intervals are universal in a certain regime. Okay. And uh, we can also derive further universal constraints on the void formation probabilities by using um, the fact that the entanglement entropy of A has to be equal to that of A bar. So we can um, consider the, the cases where A consists of multiple intervals, and then we, find, we continue to find further non-trivial constraints. So we wrote down some examples for the N equals two case uh, in the paper, and in principle, you can continue doing this for more intervals. Okay, so are there any questions about what we did so far? Okay, um, so let me give you um, just an example of how you can see that the entanglement growth for two intervals becomes universal. Um, so uh, now consider two finite intervals, A1 and A2, and we're interested in computing the union. Uh, and again, we use the same formula. So we want to find the total number of operators which end up in A1 union A2. Um, so when we calculate this, we end up with a factor which comes from the number of operators in these initial domains of dependence. And um, any initial operator which lies within this region J, we can see that its endpoints would necessarily propagate to inside A1 and A2, particular choices of the parameter values in the time. So, uh, so then um, we end up getting a factor from void formation, which is just G of R, JR includes from all possible operators inside this J of R region. But uh, we found that this quantity G of R, JRT, uh, is just equal to Q to the 2T minus R in all systems which are light cone growth from the universal constraint that we just obtained. Um, so we can see that in all systems with the sharp light cone growth property, the two interval result has to be the same uh, for this particular range of times that we considered. And in fact, we can, um, yeah, uh, we can continue, um, we can uh, extend this reasoning to see that um, it has to be universal for times in this wider, um, in all systems which have previously observed that for such times, the results for two intervals are universal among all two dimensional CFTs. Um, but outside of this time, uh, we'll find that we actually need to take into account some other set of void formation functions, which are non-universal. And this will end up leaving the differences between the chaotic systems that I mentioned earlier. Those of this later. Okay. Great. Uh, so far we talked about features which result from unitarity. Uh, and now let me talk about another universal feature which has to do with the generation of multipartite entanglement. So let's return to this case um, of the complement of a certain uh, finite interval, A, then we can try to calculate the mutual information between these semi-infinite regions, B1 and B2. Uh, so we can define a second Rennie version of the mutual information, which is just um, the sum of the mutual information of the individual regions minus the, sorry, it's the sum of the entropies of the individual minus the uh, entanglement entropy of the union. So this is something that we just computed before. And uh, in this quantity, we took into a uh, void formation phase. But uh, void formation does not contribute to the entanglement entropies of the regions B1 and B2, right? And we can see this because if um, an operator forms a void, then it ends up in both B1 and B2. So it doesn't contribute to the entanglement entropies of any individual one of these regions, okay? The only initial operators uh, due to the entanglement entropy of B1 are the ones which lie in the domain of dependence of B1. And then from similar reasoning as before, we can see that this quantity will just decay like Q to the minus T at all times. Um, so when we put this into the, for the mutual information, we find that that is just by the log of the problem of the void formation function from the okay? 
So here we can see directly that the mutation in these two regions is precisely being generated by processes of void formation, which create non trivialized in the union of these two regions. Okay. Um, and now we can extend, define a similar formation function in disjoint regions to AN. Okay, so this can be defined um, as the sum of probability that initial operators in rows, which are contained within region Q, be trivial in each of regions A1, A2 through AN, and are non trivial in each of the regions R0, R1 through RN. Okay, so if we consider such processes, then they contribute to the entanglement entropy of the union of these regions R0 through Rn. They don't contribute to the entanglement of any subset of the unions, uh, sorry, any subset of the RE. Okay, so, so in this sense, it's very natural to interpret this as a measure of multiplied entanglement among all the regions R0 through Rn. Uh, this doesn't seem to be simply related to the n partite information. Uh, in the world, the single interval case was to the mutual information, um, that it might provide some new measure of multi-partite entanglement. Okay, so are there any questions about um, about this discussion? Okay, uh, first we can uh, easily generalize this to high dimensions. So the picture is still that if there is an initial operator which uh, becomes non-trivial in each of the regions A1, 2, and A that is trivial in their then uh, process should contribute to multi-partite multi entanglement between these regions. Okay, so, so far we talked about universal features and now let me come to the non-universal features of entanglement growth between integrable and chaotic systems uh, and how we see that in this same framework. Um, so let's return to the example of two intervals and now let's see a, a case in which um, we have a non-universal result for entanglement, for the void formation probability and for entanglement growth. Um, so here um, we've taken the two intervals to be of the same length and we've taken R between them to be of a length greater than the length of the intervals. So this is, if you recall, exactly the same example in which I showed you non-universal results for entanglement growth between integral and chaotic systems. Um, and for this, if we wanted to find um, the number of operators which end up inside the union of A1 and A2, then um, not all operators which are in this region J of R would end up within the union of A1 and A2 by forming a void in R. Because in particular, if there's something which has its endpoint here, then this would propagate outside of the union of the intervals, okay? So we need to consider a restricted void formation function, G of R C T, where uh, C is this region, and it's not equal to J. The quantity that we had the universal result for was G of R, J of R T. So, um, so, so this can in principle be different between different systems and it does turn out to be very. Uh, so one way in which we can find uh, this function is if we know the probability of void formation from all initial operators in the system in the region R, because in particular we can find the probability of void formation from all operators in the region C. Um, and this probability ends up having a very different form between integrable and chaotic systems. Okay. Um, very briefly about the types of models that we considered. So we always um, had a circuit structure for our time evolution, and we constructed the time evolution operator and local operators. Um, and we chose three different choices of these local unitaries which led to, uh, in one case, just a discrete version of the quasi-particle model, which I described earlier. Um, and in another case, it led to, um, so when we chose these local unitaries to be tensors, it led to a sort of integrable uh, acting system. Um, and um, we can also take these unitary operators to be hard and in that case, we get a unitary circuit, which is an example of a weak system. Okay. Uh, one thing that is true in all three of these models is that they show sharp light cone growth of the endpoints of the operators. Uh, and, um, uh, and so we were able to check that uh, they satisfy all the general universal constraints that we expected light cone growth that I mentioned earlier. Okay, but now about the differences between these. Um, 
integral systems, in both the examples of the integral systems, we found that this probability of void formation is sensitively dependent on the precise location of the region R in the light cone of O. Um, so in the quasi-particle model, we can find, um, the, the quasi-particle model is very simple. So in this, we can actually find uh, this probability from all initial operators, all regions R. Uh, and for the, the results for entanglement growth mentioned earlier, including this dip that occurs um, in the two interval example. Um, and in the perfect tensor model, um, it's a little more difficult to find these precisely for all initial operators uh, and final operators in closed form. We found this interesting property that, um, so, so this uh, perfect tensor model is a Clifford, which some in early operators, we also end up with a product, a tensor product of matrices at later times. Um, and so then we can plot uh, as a function of time so time is the upward direction here and this is space. And we started with some initial operator which is trivial on these sides. Um, and then we just plotted all non-trivial operators um, as shaded sites and all uh, identity operators as white sites. And then we see that, um, that we, um, this kind of interesting fractal pattern formation. But one feature of this that we can see is that uh, we're very sensitive to uh, precisely where we are in the light. We want to find this probability. Because, for example, if I'm in this region, then the probability would be one, whereas if I'm in this region, the probability would be zero. So they're very shifted from each other. Okay. So, so in general, that, that this uh, dependent location is sensitive in integral systems. Um, but in chaotic systems, we propose a very different and very simple form of the void formation probability which is just that if we um, consider some region R which is inside the light of the operator O, then uh, the probability of void formation is given by one over dr squared, where dr is the dimension of the Hilbert space in R. Um, and, if, and then we just say that the probability of void formation is zero. Okay. Um, and one feature of this that we can immediately is that this probability depends only on the size of the region R and not on uh, the specific location within the light. Okay, so we expect this to be true in general chaotic systems because by explicit calculation in the chaotic random circuit. Um, and uh, it also makes sense physically because um, somehow this is telling us that the distribution of operators between the endpoints is becoming uniform because there are dr squared possible operators in this region um, and the identity is one of these operators and uh, so it just ends up being one over dr squared, okay? Um, right. So this goes for chaotic systems at late enough times. Are there any questions about this? Great. So uh, we find that if we assume random void distribution, and we also make a couple of other simplifying assumptions, including sharp light cone growth, and assuming through, um, and if we also assume that the dimension of the Hilbert space each site is large, then we're able to reproduce um, the entanglement growth for two and that was earlier found in holographic one plus one dimensional ZF, which are a class of highly chaotic systems. Um, and in fact, we can extend the same intervals with a duration of the random void distribution for a larger number of intervals, uh, which is again very simple. Uh, and from that, we find that we recover precisely the result for entanglement growth in holographic uh, CFTs for n intervals. Okay. Can I ask a question? So um, oh. Yeah. Uh, so, so in that, I, I assume this this um, behavior you're talking about is this monotonic increasing and then like plateau in the holographic so, systems. Uh, well, so actually, it's more. Um, so it was monotonically in and plateau in the very simple I showed you for uh, tables such that the separation is in the length of the intervals. Right. But more generally, there is like a complicated uh, expression which involves a minimization of different of the endpoints. Um, so in, in principle, that has a very intricate dependence on the parameters, like what all the lengths are of the different regions. Um, and the Right. So in, in that paper by Hartman that I think you've referenced, um, what they found so let's let's just assume that they're like very far away these two intervals in which case i think 
we go back to the simpler case, they found mm -hmm. that that it's um, it's monotonic if it's um, the von Neumann entropy, but if they're looking at the Renyi entropy, there's still a this quasi particle dip. So if they're looking at Renyi too, uh, even for holographic CFTs, so um, does that mean that you don't um, that these holographic CFTs are not as chaotic? Um, because they have this quasi-particle dip for the Renyi 2, which I think is what you're looking at. Yeah, so they were calculating the Renyi entropy in the holographic theory in a slightly different setup where they film a field double, and then they had some offset intervals in different copies of the film of field double. So we weren't sure exactly how to add that result to what we were calculating. But when I make the statement, I'm comparing the second Renyi entropy that we found for our system to the von Neumann entropy, which was calculated in holographics. Um, but that was calculated in a set that's more similar to ours uh, and intervals in the same copy of the system. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so, so we're not sure how to compare to the, the second Renyi entropy. Um, right. Okay, so um, so so we that that, um, that um, the random void distribution might provide simple principle that can explain um, the, at least uh, the functional form of the entropy that is seen for the von Neumann entropy in these systems, um, and it can it can be a very simple input uh, which reproduces that result. Um, great. Okay. So, um, a very interesting aspect of this graphic is that uh, the largest possible value of the entanglement entropy that is possible in any system for n intervals. Okay, so in particular, in the two interval case, because the second Renyi entropy is always smaller than the von Neumann entropy, the value of the second Renyi entropy that we find from the random void distribution is the largest possible value that it can take in any system. Okay. Uh, but recall that this value of the second Renyi entropy is determined by void formation function G of ACT. Uh, so the sum of probabilities that initial operators in region C are trivial in the region A at time T. Um, for, and, and so if we know this function for all possible regions C, then we can relate it to the entanglement entropy for um, different um, sets of intervals. Okay. Um, but um, so, so if you combine these two facts, then you find that uh, for, uh, for any regions uh, A and C uh, in the system, um, this uh, function has to be, uh, for in any region, this has to take a value that is larger than the value that is obtained from the random void distribution, um, which, is, um, uh, which is given by this. Uh, but somehow, so this is telling us that from any individual region, the random void distribution minimizes the amount of void formation um, uh, that, and it gives the minimal possible amount of void formation that can be consistent with. Okay, um, so let me talk about uh, now some generalizations and some further applications uh, of these results, mostly uh, part of an upcoming paper. Uh, so for a single interval, uh, I talked mostly about the second Renyi entropy so far. But it's also possible to show that uh, for higher n, the nth Renyi entropy um, also has to have the same linear growth and saturation form that we found um, for the second Renyi entropy. Okay? And then the question arises of how to make sure that um, the entanglement entropy of the region A is equal to that of uh, the region A bar for the nth Renyi entropy. Um, so we found one sufficient um, property of operator growth which can ensure this. Um, which was also the realization of random void distribution to higher n. So now we need to consider some generalization of the probability of uh, n, and uh, this one is the one that we propose. Um, so again, we um, decompose this O of t as a sum of O1 of t, 2 of t, um, where this O1 part has a void in A. And then uh, we look at the trace of O1 to the power of n divided by the trace of O to the power of n. Um, and this ends up being equal to one over dA to the two n minus one for times um, greater than A over two when the region A is in the light cone of O. Um, 
um, and uh, it's equal to zero otherwise. So um, of course, if we put n equal to two in this, we just get back the random void distribution. Um, uh, and, and what we find in random unitary circuits for higher n. So we expect that this should be true in uh, general chaotic systems, just based on the unitary circuit calculation. Um, and uh, we can check that it is sufficient to ensure that um, this um, uh, result for a single interval is equal to um, that of its complement or general n. Okay. Um, and suppose, uh, so another application of this generalized random void distribution that I mentioned on the previous slide is that if we have a finite system and we write its density matrix as a sum of two parts, um, so we, we can write it as a sum part that's proportional to the identity and a traceless part row hat, um, then if we assume that uh, the generalized random void distribution is true for this non-trivial part row hat at late times, um, and we consider some region A, which is much smaller than its complement, then we find that all the Renyi entropies of A at late times are equal to those of A bar, and they're all given by the log of DA. Okay. So this is essentially telling us that the density matrix on the small region A is like the thermal density matrix at infinite temperature, um, which is equivalent to the statement that the initial state has evolved to a typical pure state or reached equilibrium at infinite temperature, even if it was originally far from equilibrium. Okay, so so this uh, generalized random distribution is a sufficient to ensure equilibrium at infinite temperature in this sense. And in fact, we can also show that it's a necessary condition for any small region A. Okay, so if we want that an arbitrary initial state should reach a typical state and we require our system to be unitary, then uh, we need the generalized random void distribution to be true for any small region A. Okay, um, great. So, um, so those are all the results that I wanted to mention. And uh, I'll just briefly talk about some further applications and some future things that we would like to do. Um, so we also used similar ideas to understand um, another famous conflict with unitarity called the black hole information paradox. Uh, and in particular, we were able to find that the random void distribution leads to the page curve of black hole evaporation. Um, and we also believe that this provides a more microscopic explanation for some recent prescriptions in semi-classical gravity, which resolve the black hole information paradox. Um, and uh, we would like in the future to provide more evidence that the random void distribution should be a property for any chaotic system by studying chaotic spin chains and the SYK model. Um, and we would also like to understand more about the time scale at which we expect it to be true. Um, and then it would be nice to extend these arguments not only to the higher any entropies, but also to the von Neumann entropy. Um, and, uh, and then we would also like to understand how these ideas extend to continuum theories and to finite temperatures. And in particular, how the story about equilibration that I mentioned on the previous slide extends to finite temperatures. Yeah, so that's everything that I wanted to talk about. Um, are there any questions? So if anyone has any questions, just please unmute yourself. So uh, I have two questions. First, so there's, uh, you say this, this works for generic chaotic system. Did you consider systems with conservation law? And no, we didn't. And we expect that it should be modified um, in systems with con conservation laws, but we expect that even in systems without, oh, sorry, even in systems with conservation laws, um, like if there's energy conservation, for instance, then we expect that maybe this whole picture should still apply to infinite temperatures, initial states. About finite temperature, or in like, let's consider system with U1 conservation law, and like uh, with finite polarization, how does this work? Yeah, so this should, uh, so we would definitely need to consider a slightly different uh, quantity from the one that I mentioned. Um, so, so instead of, so we would have to potentially define a void in a different way in such theory, um, like maybe something more like the thermal density matrix uh, or the, uh, the density matrix corresponding to equilibration in the charge system. Uh, but we don't fully understand exactly how to modify this for those systems. Okay, the second question I have is mention this perfect tensor network. So it's a Clifford, it's a special Clifford circuit. 
Yeah. So I remember for coniferous circuits, operator dynamics is kind of trivial, right? You start with any Nike mm -hmm. as a pony operator. There's no, mm -hmm. it's always become another pony string operator. This night operator dynamics is kind of trivial over there, right? Right, yeah. So, um, yeah, so at every future time, what we're plotting is exactly the Pauli operator that you get at a later time. And we're just plotting um, the, um, any non-trivial operator with black and any uh, trivial and the identity operator with white. But uh, there you can see that there's already a non-trivial structure of where voids are formed and where they're not. And you can see that, um, that you get non-trivial growth of entanglement in these systems, which is different from both of these other models. Um, so it's, in, it's a, so, but in perfect tensor model, if you start with the product state, does there entangle, is there any entanglement dynamics? Yes, in general, uh, in this type of liquid circuit, you do expect that entanglement grows linearly. And that's happening exactly because you can see that um, these, um, uh, you can see that this operator has this sharp light cone growth behavior. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and that immediately leads to linear growth of entanglement for a connected region. But you can have some special initial states which are invariant under the circuit, but okay. in ge from general initial states, you do see entanglement growth. Okay, another question is like, have you ever tried other conifer dynamics? Let's say you consider random conifer dynamics. What do you see in the operator dynamics? Um, yeah, we didn't consider a random Clifford circuit. We cons when we considered the random circuit, that was from the Haar measure. Um, so, so that I, was I an average. That, yeah, I would expect that the random Clifford dynamics would be like similar to this Haar random dynamics. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure about uh, I think that there have been some papers which have studied this and they mentioned that there were some differences between the random Clifford circuits and the high random circuits, but I don't exactly remember what the statement was. What moment of the unitary group do you have to average over to get this? Because that would determine whether Clifford uh, circuits give you the same thing. Did you roll on to Lizzie? Oh. Uh, so you uh, always average Oh, Aster. Um, so, so you always have, uh, uh, four, no. so you have a U times U star times U times U star. So it's like the second moment, um, for the second running entropy, but, uh, but then this result, um, um, the higher end result depends on uh, the nth moment essentially. So this statement here depends on, um, N copies of U times U dagger. But I guess the Clifford circuits are not, yeah, I don't think that the average of the Clifford circuits is the same for the second moment as the higher average. I think, I think there are three designs. So anything above the second moment won't work, but up to three it will work. Oh, I think I remember seeing that the results for OTOCs are different between Clifford circuits and, um, random unitaries, but I'm not entirely sure. Because the OTOCs also involve the second moment. Yeah, but I'm not entirely sure. Okay, any other questions? I have another question. So why do you call this perfect tensor network as an interacting, like uh, uh, integrable system? Um, yeah, so this is a sort of heuristic statement, um, which I don't think there is a precise definition of an interacting integrable system, but um, um, somehow it's a system which can generate entanglement and there are certainly, it's not like the free theory example in the quasi-particle model, where you can think of uh, the different degrees of freedom as just being decoupled from each other, um, because you do have generate interactions between adjacent sites through a perfect tensor. Um, uh, but at the same time, it behaves like an integrable system because, for example, it doesn't generate any operator entanglement uh, since you always go to a product of Pauli operators. Um, so it can be seen as something in between this free theory and the highly chaotic random unitary circuits. So have you tried like, to introduce some like a small amount of random like a Knieford gate 
and see how uh, this fractal structure changes with the time? Uh, no, we didn't try doing that, but that would be an interesting question. Okay, I don't have other questions. Yeah. I had a question. Uh, Aisha, thanks for the nice talk. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, could you comment on like how easy or difficult it would be to extend this analysis to like uh, an initial condition which was entangled, like let's say, in, um, distant um, parts of the system? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. So, um, so what I wasn't telling you that implicitly in. Uh, this quasi-particle model, I was starting with an initial state which had short range entanglement between adjacent sites. Um, so this whole thing that we did relies on writing, uh, um, on writing this density matrix as a sum like the one that I showed you um, over, um, uh, yeah, a sum of this type. And you can write a similar sum for uh, states which have some short range entanglement between adjacent sites. Um, but yeah, but I'm not sure that that would be a simple um, expression which would be like an equal superposition of all of these different basis operators if we had a general entangled state. Um, so yeah, so that might be more difficult to study. But in principle, we can still decompose it, whatever the operator is, we can decompose it in this basis. And we can again look at the Heisenberg evolution of all of these operators. But maybe if the in the initial state they have some complicated coefficients, then it's not as easy to study. I see. And and what if there's like long range entanglement, like some sort of topological state in I don't know, in some maybe two uh, D model. Like you showed higher dimensional versions. So um is that also like is it possible to extend it to that? Like long range entangled state? Yeah, we didn't consider any examples of long range entangled states. So, in particular, we don't know exactly how those would be written in a basis like this, but that would be pretty interesting to look at. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? So, I had one um, question. It might be a naive question, but how is there a way to possibly experimentally verify void formation in, say, a model system? Um, or what are the implications in experiments? Yeah, I guess if we could measure um, entanglement growth in experiments, then we would see uh, some of these um, consequences of void formation. But if we wanted to measure this probability more Directly, um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure if there's any way of like um, measuring probabilities in this, uh, like probabilities like these, which occur in the Heisenberg evolution. Um, I guess there is also, in principle, a way of expressing this probability of void formation in terms of a non-local set of out-of-time ordered correlators as a sum of OTOCs with more extended operators which are spread throughout this region A. Um, so maybe if people can measure OTOCs in labs, then that could be a way. Um, yeah. Thank you. So any other? Oh, sure, yeah. sure. Can I ask a question? So you mentioned that you, ex you expect this uh, conjecture about void formation, the random void distribution to hold for other chaotic systems like SYK. Uh, but what I'm concerned about is like, uh, if if it's a non-local system, how do you define what is a what is the interior of and of the operator front and what is outside? Yeah, so in that case, we don't really have a description uh, of being between the endpoints of the operator. Um, it, in that case, we would just say that we're interested in times which are greater than the scrambling time of the full system, where we expect that the front of the operator is just spread throughout the system. And then we would consider any uh, subregion uh, and ask whether the the operator has a probability of being equal to the identity in that subregion or not. So we wouldn't just be saying um, regions within um, within the light cooling or something like that. So, so in particular, if you if you if you just took like a random unitary random unitary uh, evolution without locality without any brickwork structure. Would you would you still be get the void the void distribution like 
Yeah, so you should expect to get it at times which are greater than the scrambling time for the full system. Um, and then it should apply to any subregion of the full system. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, any final questions? Okay, so maybe let's thank Shreya again.